Hi, everyone. A quick comment before the episode starts. To keep making these episodes, we need your support. If you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel and share with your friends. Every subscription helps. If you're listening on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or any other podcast platform, please give us a rating and leave a review. Your feedback is really important because it keeps us going. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. The United Nations has raised alarm over the illicit proliferation of small arms and light weapons in Nigeria, saying that more than 350 million out of the estimated 500 million of such weapons in West Africa is domiciled in the country. The security in this country has come to the lowest step, and we have to all wake up. And if we cannot be able to provide security for our citizens, then allow all the citizens to buy AK-47. Anybody with AK-47 should be shot. You call AK-47. It's supposed to be registered and is only given to security officials. From Triple E Media, I'm Ramat Mohammed. And this is The Backstory. Since the early 2000s, Nigeria has been battling one form of insecurity or another. Oil banditry and kidnappings in the Niger Delta, Boko Haram terrorists in the Northeast, and now cattle banditry, gold banditry, and kidnappings in the Northwest. And Nigeria has tried and is trying different solutions to curb the rising insecurity. Central to all of the conflicts is the availability of small arms and light weapons, which tend to keep these conflicts going and in some cases even escalate them. Now we're going to be looking at the issues of guns and gun control in Nigeria over a series of episodes. In this first one, Richard and Alex are going to discuss the AK-47 and the government's latest directive for the military to shoot on sight any civilian caught carrying an AK-47. On Thursday, the 11th of March, President Muhammadu Buhari held a meeting with the National Council of Traditional Rulers of Nigeria. Our best hasn't proved to be good enough, but we are getting desperate. And we are given the orders to the military especially in six weeks' time, I want The meeting was also attended by the newly appointed service chiefs. And the president goes on to say that we've tried everything else to stop this problem. We closed our borders for about 17 months, but still the bandits and criminals are getting access to arms and ammunition. I see how they attacked police stations, killed the police, ransacked the armory and the magazine. The state government is saturated. The local government is saturated. And nobody will bring a power to invest in Nigeria if they keep on making Nigeria insecure. And as a last resort, security forces have been ordered to shoot anyone caught carrying an AK-47 rifle illegally. Now, this order didn't come out of nowhere. And like you said, Different governments have tried different approaches to solve our insecurity problems. Oil banditry and kidnappings in the Niger Delta, that's in the southern part of the country, was just so high between 2004 and 2006. In 2009, our former president, that's uh, Umar Musa Yaradua, he granted amnesty to the Niger Delta militants. The offer of amnesty is predicated on the willingness and the readiness of the militants to give up all illegal illegal arms in their possession, completely renounce militancy willingly and unconditionally, and depose to an undertaking. Now, insecurity in the Niger Delta hasn't stopped completely, but the amnesty deal did work in terms of slowing down the problem and stopping it from getting a lot bigger. 
And now the recent upsurge of cattle banditry, gold banditry and kidnappings in the Northwest has led to various proposals on how to deal with the Northwest bandits. On the one hand, the governor of Kaduna State, Nasiru Erufai, wants to wipe them out completely. And in Kaduna State, we have zero tolerance for bandits. We don't give them amnesty. We don't negotiate with them. We have asked the security agencies to just wipe them out. But on the other hand, the governor of Zamfara, Matawali, wants to offer them amnesty. That due to my initiation of dialoguing with them, uh, now Zampara is very calm and uh, I have been... Calling. Although the two proposed solutions are polar opposites, they do have one thing in common. The AK-47. For El Rufai, the bandits who tend to carry AK-47s can't be saved and should be wiped out. For Matawale, the bandits should be offered a chance to surrender their weapons, like the Niger Delta militants were. In July 2020, he offered the bandits two cattle in exchange for surrendering their guns. Since then, he's given the bandits until May of this year, that's 2021, to accept amnesty or face the consequences from security forces. Basically, they will get wiped out if they don't take the amnesty agreement. Hmm. Richard, the AK-47 has been a central feature to the discussions that we've been having in this country right now. That's right. Now, there are other small arms and light weapons in Nigeria aside from the AK-47. Like you heard in the beginning, the United Nations Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Africa estimates that there are over 500 million illegal small arms and light weapons in Africa, and 350 million of them are in Nigeria. Richard, that number, 350 million, that seems like a big number. It's a large number. Our population is about 200 million. So that would mean that there are enough guns for every citizen, be it a man, a woman, and even a child, to have at least one to two guns. We are not sure how the UN came up with that 350 million number, but we reached out to them for them to comment on this, but no response at the time of this recording. So for the sake of this report, we assumed that the 350 million is correct. And given that the AK-47 has become the most featured weapon when it comes to discussions about small arms and light weapons in Nigeria, we wanted to know more about the weapon. The AK-47 is a small arms, right? So um, it, it has never actually started wars, but it keeps wars, especially small wars, going because all you have to do is have somebody with a rifle and they're in the business of war. That's Larry Kahana. Now, Kahana is an award-winning journalist and author of over 15 non-fiction books. As we were working on this story, one of his books caught our attention. AK-47, The Weapon That Changed the Face of War, was written by Kahana and published in 2007. I wrote the AK-47 for the same reason that you and I are talking about it, is that I saw this everywhere. I saw this weapon on television, I saw it in movies, I just saw it everywhere. I even saw it in pop culture. And in my book, I have pictures of where it's been used to make lamps and so forth. And, and I thought, what, what is this weapon? Why is everybody um, looking at this weapon and thinking about this weapon? And why has it become a symbol of terrorism around the world? So to understand really why the AK-47 has literally become a target for the Buhari administration, we wanted to know more about the weapon itself. The AK-47 is an automatic weapon, a gun that is able to fire 600 rounds per minute. It has a very distinct sound to go with its very recognizable shape. And the AK-47 has a distinctive look. It has that curved shape magazine underneath it. You know, they call it a banana clip or a banana magazine. And it's shaped like a banana. And it's got that curve to it that everybody knows. If you just took a shadow picture of an AK-47 and show it to somebody, they go, oh yeah, that's an AK-47. Everybody knows it. And that shape and that um, uh, icon has made its way on coins. You see it in coins in certain countries. You'll see it on flags. Uh, you'll see it in pop culture. You'll see it everywhere. It's that look. And also the weapon itself has become the iconic look 
of a terrorist. And so whenever you see, um, like, uh, Osama bin Laden, he was always photographed with an AK-47. And because the weapon has spread so far and wide, it has become so globally recognized. From its point of origin in the Soviet Union, the AK-47 has reached pretty much every corner of the globe. In his book, Kahana calls the AK-47 the world's most devastating weapon. Now, when most of us think about devastating weapons, we think of missiles, bombs, the atomic bomb even. But according to Small Arms Survey, a research center in Switzerland, there are more than one billion firearms in the world. And most of them, about 85%, are in the hands of civilians. And every year, over half a million people are killed as a result of armed violence. Now, we don't know the exact number of AK-47s out there, but an article by NPR published in 2013 estimates that at least 100 million are in circulation. And the weapon has made it into the hands of virtually every armed group in the world. According to Kahana, the weapon established its reputation during the Vietnam War in the 1960s and in the 1970s. American soldiers hiking their way through the sweaty jungles of South Vietnam, searching for an elusive enemy. The temperature is almost 100 degrees, and the jungle stifles even the tiniest breeze. The going is slow. There could be a North Vietnamese... In that war, Vietnamese soldiers armed primarily with AK-47 and superior knowledge of the terrain were able to beat back a well-trained American military, which came with the sophisticated weapons like the M16. In the next 20 years after Vietnam, the AK-47 would rise to become the chosen weapons for terrorists and insurgencies all over the world. In the 1980s, rebel groups in Afghanistan, that is the Mujahideens, were armed by the American CIA with AK-47s in order to fight against Soviet invasion. And according to Kahana, this decision to buy AK-47 for the Mujahideens may have been the most important single contribution to the global spread of the weapon. By the time the Soviet left Afghanistan in 1989, there was a well-established trade route for weapons. And since the route had been operating for a decade, it became part of the region's economy, and most importantly, Kalashnikovs became part of their culture. Now, as the Soviet war in Afghanistan was winding down, a new conflict hotspot was developing about 8,000 kilometers away. This is just an ordinary civilian uprising. It's not a military war, not a military situation. Ordinary people uprising, trying to bring fair play and justice. In 1989, Charles Taylor returned to West Africa after getting militia training in Libya under Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. Taylor had one goal, to overthrow Sergeant Samuel Doe's regime and become president of Liberia. To do that, he needed weapons. So the weapons were moved from Afghanistan to West Africa. According to Kahana, Taylor was able to build an entire army and his only expense was an AK-47, which cost him less than $50 each, and in some cases, even as low as $10. For the first time in modern history, the world witnessed war that was not fought between armies of established countries, no. Instead, the conflict in Liberia led by Taylor and his militia was aimed at terrorizing his own country's population. With the AK-47s, soldiers were permitted to commit all sorts of atrocities, including rape and ethnic slaughter. And between 1990 and 1996, more than 150,000 people were killed. It was also during this conflict that the world saw yet another wartime perversion. Children as young as eight years old holding AK-47s roamed the streets of Liberia and then Sierra Leone, high on marijuana, cocaine and amphetamines, just killing and maiming in the most brutal ways. Hmm. Alex, I'm beginning to understand why President Buhari has issued the shoot on sight order for anyone holding an AK-47 illegally. There is historical context of the devastation that these weapons have caused in West Africa. And frankly, the risk that history will repeat itself is real, especially when you account for our young population. Exactly. We have a very young population. 
The World Bank has stated that 42% of sub-Saharan Africa's total population is 14 years and under, with low education levels, no job prospects to keep them busy and out of trouble. And as you've pointed out several times, this age group tends to have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, underdeveloped consciences, which makes them very easy to manipulate. So we absolutely must do everything we can to keep AK-47s out of their hands. This might mean keeping the weapon out of the country altogether, but that might be easier said than done. Now, remember we said that the AK-47 or some variations of it exist virtually everywhere around the world. Well, the AK-47 is like a virus. Now, viruses that make their way around the world have two things going for them. One, they can replicate themselves quickly and easily. And two, they last long enough to transfer from one person to another. The AK-47 has certain characteristics that made it go viral. The AK-47 is a weapon that looks like a machine gun, but kind of acts like a rifle. In other words, it's very light. Machine guns are very heavy. You can't really carry them around. But uh, this kind of automatic weapon uh, can be carried around, and it's a very highly effective uh, killing machine. This was a a mass-produced weapon, very easily produced weapon, inexpensive, that can do a lot of damage. And in some countries, especially like in Central America, where uh, you have hot wars that that come and go, depending upon regime, people will have their AK-47s, and they will literally bury them in the dirt by their house And if they find that they need them again in eight years, they just dig them up and they still work. And that's, and so then they're in the, they're in the war again. Um, And that's, you know, that's how they, that's, that's their staying power. Again, they're so inexpensive and they last so long that um, there's no reason to ever get rid of them. Now, three of these characteristics, that is durable, cheap, and easy to use, make the AK-47 the weapon of choice for countries that don't have a lot of money to spend to arm their military, like Nigeria. Our security forces, including our military, use the AK-47. But those same factors that make the AK-47 attractive to our government security forces are the same factors that make the weapon accessible to rebel groups and other rogue elements, like the militants, the militias, and the bandits. The AK-47 was invented by a man named Mikhail Kalishnikov in Soviet Union. The A in AK stands for automatic and the K stands for Kalashnikov, the inventor's name. The 47 is the year that it was first approved for production, 1947. Put that together, you get AK-47. Now, the inventor of the original AK-47 prototype never intended for his weapon to be used by children or militants, militias, terrorists, or bandits. But the problem is, when you make something that's durable, cheap, and easy to use, it doesn't matter what your intentions were. Because once something like this makes its way into the world, you've opened Pandora's box. You cannot control what happens with it. And what's happening now is that the AK-47s are available on the black market in Nigeria. In July 2020, the BBC reported that the price of an AK-47 rifle in Nigeria could cost as high as 500,000 naira, which is equivalent to $1,200 or 950 pounds. That's probably for a new one. Though. Remember, these weapons have a long lifetime. 30 years, maybe 40 years, and even 50. Old and used AKs will likely be much cheaper. Hmm, Richard, so then the question is, how do these weapons get on the black market in the first place? Very good question. So to answer that, let's first talk about the legitimate ways that we get AK-47s in this country. The Defense Industries Corporation of Nigeria, DICON, actually manufactures a similar version of the AK-47. That version is called the OBJ-006. Now, DICON makes these weapons for military use. And as you heard the president say, the AK-47s are only given to security officials. When we spoke with Kahana, he did mention other ways that our government could procure AK-47s. There are people around the world who are armed dealers. This is what they do for a living. Uh, Victor Bout is, is a very famous one. Uh, Cummings is a famous one. And they're, you know, they're companies. They're individuals and they're companies. And they 
buy arms from makers or they buy arms from countries that don't want them anymore and they resell them. And this just keeps going around the world. And it's just like any other commodity. It's sold and bought. And you'll see it happen in a country that will have a civil war. And then also, not all of a sudden, but the civil war is over. People often will turn in their weapons sometimes or the government will confiscate them. Um, then they're resold to these armed dealers who sell them to the to someone else who's having a civil war. And it, it goes around the world like that. And you'll find these are imp almost impossible to trace, although it has been done. And you'll find the same weapon show up in you know five different countries at five different times. Because the weapon lasts so long, uh, you'll see it just move from country to country. As far as the large company countries that sell arms, like the United States is a very large arms seller, and, it, and China sells a lot of very large arms, you know, tanks, uh, missiles, so forth. There's not that much money in these small weapons, um, small arms, like the AK. So what happens is they'll throw that in as part of the deal. Sometimes just to get rid of them because you know, you know, they don't want to sell them, um, and and so you'll buy you know five planes and six tanks and yes I'll throw in a hundred thousand or ten thousand AK forty seven so it's kind of you know a sweetener sometimes. So basically, when Nigeria orders high military grade equipment like fighter aircraft from China, the US, or other arms dealers, parts of that delivery may include AK forty sevens as an add on. Remember that these weapons are inexpensive to make. So countries that trade in arms don't really make money from selling the AK-47s. So to recap, as far as we know, there are three legitimate ways that the AK-47 ends up in Nigeria. One, the weapon is manufactured here by approved manufacturers for military use alone. Two, the weapon could be included as part of shipment of high military grade arms. Three, the weapon could be ordered directly from a manufacturer abroad by the government. So, in order for the AK-47s to end up in the black market, they either have to somehow come from a legitimate stockpile or they have to come in illegally through the borders. And Alex, is there also a possibility that they're being manufactured in our own country illegally? That's right. On the 19th of April 2019, BBC Pigeon published a report of an illegal gun factory operating out of Benue State that had been producing illegal arms, including AK-47s, for the past 20 years. And Small Arms Survey, that's the Swiss research organization, published a report in 2018 about craft production of small arms in Nigeria. Craft production basically means making weapons by hand and in small quantities. Craft weapons are cheaper to make compared to weapons made by industrial production. Punch newspaper reported that a craft AK-47 can be sold for about 350,000 naira. That's about $900. Now, small arms survey found that craft production is actually a huge and important source of illicit weapons in Nigeria. Their analysis shows that between 2014 and 2017, 1,150 craft weapons were seized in Nigeria compared to 409 industrial weapons. The other way that AK-47s and other small arms and light weapons make their way into the hands of civilians is if they somehow come from the legitimate stockpile, for example, when police stations get raided. According to the Punch newspaper, 100 AK-47 rifles were looted from Lagos police stations during the NSAS protests. And finally, the last way for AK-47s and other small arms to end up in Nigeria illegally is if they get smuggled through our borders. The Nigerian Customs Service Sinkan Island Port Command has intercepted a large cache of arms and military hardware in Apapa, Lagos. Briefing journalists at the command before... That was a channel's television report about weapons seized back in 2016 at one of the ports in Lagos. Apart from seaports, Nigeria shares land borders with four other countries. To the north is Niger, to the east are Chad and Cameroon, and to the west is Benin Republic. There is some level of insecurity in each of these countries, and we know that as of 2015, AK-47s were flowing into Niger from Libya. There is no doubt that these weapons in Niger have ended up in Nigeria as well. 
And these weapons don't just end up in the hands of civilians. There is demand for these weapons. Small arms survey found that individual and community protection was the number one intended purpose for craft weapons, followed by hunting. But as Alex said, once these weapons are made available, you cannot control how they end up getting used. And when they are introduced into areas of conflict, the conflict only gets worse. The AK-47 is a contributor to democratization of warfare. An untrained soldier can be very lethal. Um, again, children can be used as soldiers. And, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, right? So it depends upon what side you're on. And the AK has made it possible for anybody to be a very dangerous soldier in uh, any kind of war. So the key is to limit their availability. In 2001, the United Nations decided to finally take this problem head on in its first conference on the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons. According to Kahana, many countries, especially those in Africa, were hoping to get international support to help them get rid of small arms, especially the AKs from the continent. The U.S. representative at that conference, John Bolton, made it clear that the U.S. could not support certain aspects of the proposed program of action. Specifically, Bolton stated, and I quote, We do not support measures that will constrain legal trade and legal manufacturing of small arms and light weapons. We do not support measures that prohibit civilian possession of small arms. And perhaps the most damning and disappointing statement he made was, we do not support measures limiting trade in small arms and light weapons solely to governments. Speaking with Kahana, he gave us some insights into why Bolton took this position. Well, the U.S. has a belief in the Second Amendment rights of people to bear arms. And, and that has moved to where um, arms have become sort of a sacred commodity or a product in the United States. And any, any, any way to restrict that is, is taboo, is, is, is not thought of as highly. And so in the United States, that's kind of a philosophy of, of weapons, uh, light weapons. Uh, and that carries over to the political realm internationally. And that's why uh, the U.S. did not want to do that. After Bolton's comment at the conference, the U.N. pretty much lost its will to limit illegal small arms trafficking. Instead, they turned their attention to improving weapons tracing. In 2005, they adopted the International Tracing Instrument, which requires states to ensure that weapons are properly marked and that records are kept. Uh, Richard, that would help with new weapons, but what about existing small arms, existing AKs? We know that these weapons last a very long time, and the likelihood of tracing weapons that are already in circulation is low. That's right. It's not clear how much tracing would help with the weapons already in circulation. But for the newly produced weapons, tracing will absolutely help, especially if countries can standardize on how they trace in order to make information sharing much, much more easier. But for us here in Nigeria, there are a few other ways we can tackle the issue of AK-47 proliferation before it escalates. First, offer amnesty to those who have small arms and light weapons, including AK-47s, to turn in their weapons. But once these weapons are turned in, they must be destroyed. Otherwise, they will end up back in the hands of arms dealers who then recycle them back into conflict areas across the country. Second, after the amnesty period, there is the option to shoot anyone caught carrying an AK-47 illegally. But this option is difficult to reconcile with our constitution and human rights laws. Because technically speaking, we are supposed to put these people through the justice system and let the justice system deal with them. But you know the state of our justice system. And also, can we trust our security forces to carry out this order without violating human rights and resorting to impunity? And don't forget, this order to shoot anyone carrying an AK-47 will apply across the country, not just to heistmen, but also to militants in the Niger Delta and other criminal elements like the bandits, the kidnappers, who are caught with these weapons. 
Something else we can do is to find out and shut down any illegal manufacturers of small arms and light weapons. But if the craft industry is already too entrenched in the local culture, maybe we'll find ways to, you know, integrate them into the legitimate industrial arms production. Another thing we can do is to increase the controls over our legitimate stockpiles. Criminals should not be able to attack police stations and walk out with AK-47s. And finally, improve how we monitor and dictate arms coming in illegally through the land, through the sea, and through the airports. Part of this will be to ensure that the people in charge of monitoring these ports are incorruptible and that they have the training and the resources they need to do their job very well. But whatever it takes, we have to find a way to reduce access to these weapons. We cannot afford to have a culture of guns here in Nigeria. If we compare the US to the UK, the UK has a culture of hunting. UK police do not carry guns. There were 137 gun-related deaths in the UK in 2017 alone. That same year, gun-related deaths in the US reached nearly 11,000. Uh, the countries that have relatively uh, solid gun control laws, it, it, first of all, it comes from a history and, and a culture. You take the UK, for example, there is no culture there of people just owning weapons except for hunting. And, um, and so they don't have a lot of uh, small arms and, and, and pistols and, and rifles floating around. They just don't have it. Same thing with Japan. It's just not in their culture. Guns in the UK are for hunting. But in some parts of the US, the culture of guns is primarily just a culture of guns. And Nigeria has much more diversity and more points of conflict than the US population. We simply cannot afford to have a culture of guns here. Hey everyone, if you've been listening to us for a while, you know that I usually end our episodes by offering some concrete suggestions about what we can be doing to address the issues that we raised. But Richard has already done that in this episode. So instead, today I'm going to ask you to indulge in a little bit of philosophy with me. Part of my discussion with Larry Kahaner was actually around the M16 versus the AK-47. These are two different military-grade weapons made by two different countries with two different philosophies on war. One philosophy says that war is a professional undertaking to be fought by professional armies using precision-made weapons that require training. And I actually think that this philosophy used to be a global philosophy. In so many cultures around the world, war used to be exclusively in the hands of professionals. Until the professionals stopped being professional. When professionals use the power of their profession to oppress, to deny access, to make the circle of opportunity smaller and smaller, to exclude rather than include, when professionals use the power of their profession to play the finite game of winners and losers, that's when we see the emergence of a second philosophy of war. The philosophy of war as necessity. And all you need to fight the war of necessity is a crowd of people who believe that their existence is in danger, who believe that they are being oppressed, who believe that they are not being included. And that's the philosophical context that allows the AK-47 and other small arms to thrive. So if Nigeria wants to slow the flow of these weapons, yes, do all the things that Richard suggested. But if you do all of those things and ignore the philosophical, you're only buying time. The Backstory is brought to you by Triple E Media Productions. Production copyright 2021, Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and want to hear more, subscribe to our 234 Audio YouTube channel. This episode of The Backstory was produced by Richard Anyabe, Alexandra Gekpe, Nico Rivers, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Executive Producer Ramat Mohammed. 
Special thanks to Larry Kahaner, author of AK-47, The Weapon That Changed the Face of War, Antonietta Kalunta, John Iwodi, Rabia Hadeja, Stanley Bentu, Aredi Isha, and Mala Iwa Bado Ikaleku. I'm Ramat Mohammed. See you next week.